All Saints Lutheran Church is a ministry of word and sacrament. We believe, teach, and confess that Jesus Christ descends to us and is truly present with us and for us in the divine service, where he delivers his good gifts to us through the tangible, physical means of word and water, bread and wine. Communion with God involves our whole selves, including our bodies, in participation with one another and our Lord Jesus Christ. It is not meant to happen inside our heads, isolated in front of a computer screen. We are glad to offer you these video recordings and online resources to enable you to hear the word, but this can never be a replacement or substitute for the in-person divine service. While extenuating circumstances may justify temporary separation, we look forward to the day when we can receive Christ's gifts together in the divine service. to be with our Lord today 
uh, as he serves us in this divine service. A couple of announcements for today. Uh, first of all, uh, we have choir rehearsal canceled today, but there will be a rehearsal for those who can make it on Wednesday evening at 8 o'clock. Also, just to remember that the Oktoberfest is coming up very soon. Uh, on the 21st, there's sign-up sheets in the narthex for uh, various activities or ways to help. Uh, we're gonna, it's going to be a great event. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, and I hope that you will all join us uh, to come out for the Oktoberfest uh, this year. Finally, I want to welcome our visitors. We're very glad to have you with us as a congregation of the Church of Missouri Synod. We practice close communion. What that means is that we want to be uh, diligent in providing good pastoral care to those who commune with us. We want to make sure you've been properly instructed and prepared to receive the Lord's Supper. Uh, if you're not a communicant member of another Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod congregation, that means I'd like to speak with you before you receive the Lord's Supper with us, just to make sure that I do my duty as a pastor uh, toward you and for you to make sure that you are properly prepared to receive these gifts. I'd love to talk to you about that more after church today. Uh, that's it for our announcements. Let us rise for prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, David's Son, yet David's Lord, come among us today with your gifts of life and salvation, that we may rejoice in the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of eternal life. For in your name, holy name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgive me. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
and let your prophets be proven faithful. Hear the prayer of your servants according to the blessing of Aaron upon your people. According to the blessing of Aaron upon your people.
serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven, and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers, and chose their offspring after them, you above all peoples, as you are this day. Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no longer stubborn. For the Lord your God is God of gods, and Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow, and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Love the sojourner, therefore, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him and hold fast to him, and by his name you shall swear. He is your praise. He is your God, who has done for you these great and terrifying things that your eyes have seen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. second chapter. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Christ? whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David in the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, 
The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. And was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Amen. The text starts with Jesus silencing the Sadducees. What a delicious moment that must have been for the Pharisees. After all, the Pharisees and Sadducees were bitter enemies, polar opposites in many ways. And we could sympathize, I think, with the Pharisees' opposition to the Sadducees, for the Sadducees were the religious and cultural liberals of their day. They had a low view of Scripture and considered only the first five books of Moses authoritative. Accordingly, they denied the existence of angels, the resurrection of the faithful, and were not eagerly awaiting the coming of the Messiah. Even worse, they were the movers and shakers, the wealthy cultural elites who worked with their Roman occupiers rather than resist them. But perhaps their worst fault from the perspective of the Pharisees was their moral licentiousness, which follows from their low view of Scripture. That usually happens. Uh, you take a low view of Scripture and you're more likely to be morally permissive. The Pharisees, on the other hand, are strict and scrupulous. They believe the Roman occupation is a punishment from God for Israel's unfaithfulness. In their eyes, the only hope for a blessed future lies in returning Israel to obedience and faithfulness. Sadducees stood in the way of their desire for religious and moral reform. And so the result was a religious political war between the two parties, each one defining their own position in reaction to the other. We don't ever see any of that happening. As so often happens, the Pharisees, partially in reacting against the Sadducees, fell off the religious horse on the other side. To be sure, they confessed their commitment to God's Word, affirmed many of the correct doctrines that the Sadducees rejected, but they denied God's grace. They refused to love and help sinners. They bound men's consciences to their concept of salvation by works and to their man-made rules and traditions. But worst of all, they rejected the very Messiah prophesied in the Scriptures. Why did they hate Him? After all, Jesus was clearly not on board with the Sadducees' liberal program. He accused the Sadducees of not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. The Pharisees should have loved Jesus. But they didn't. And here's the reason why. They hated Jesus because he was willing to punch right. He was just as critical, if not more so, of their legalism and their lovelessness he showed grace and mercy to sinners and ate with them. Yes, even prostitutes and tax collectors. The worst of the worst. He cared about them. He didn't condemn them. He forgave their sins. And he didn't obey all their man-made rules either. He healed people and allowed his disciples to pick grain on the Sabbath. On the Sabbath! And he had friendly deep dealings with Gentiles. Gentiles. How dare he? What's his deal? The whole culture's going to hell in a handbasket, and he's attacking us. He should be helping to try to fix all this. 
We're on God's side after all. But every time He speaks to us, He's hurling condemnations. And then He goes out there and He hangs out with tax collectors and prostitutes and Gentiles violating the Sabbath and accusing us of sin. And so it happened that these bitter enemies the Pharisees and the Sadducees found one thing they could agree on, that Jesus had to go. That's why both groups were constantly putting Jesus to the test. They wanted to discredit him in the eyes of the people, catch him in his words, turn the tide of public opinion against him, and when their plans to discredit him didn't work, their thoughts turned to murder. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Scriptures say there's nothing new under the sun. And this is especially true when it comes to religion. On the one hand, the truth never changes because the truth originates in God who doesn't change. On the other hand, the same false teachings come up again and again because they originate in the always sinful hearts of sinful men. Jesus, in our text today, is confronted with the very same religious debates that we have in our day. Left versus right, liberalism versus legalism. On the left, there's the denial of the inspiration and infallibility of the Scriptures, and with it, a denial of the holy mysteries of the faith and a terrible licentiousness. The Bible is said to have errors. The account of creation is considered unscientific mythology. The deity of Christ is denied. And His exclusive claims and moral imperatives are seen as bigoted, narrow-minded, and hateful. On the right, you have the religion of Jesus plus. Jesus plus keeping all the right rules. Jesus plus the observance of all the right traditions. Jesus plus getting on board with the latest plan to retake the culture for Christ. And heaven help the man who refuses to jump on their legalistic bandwagon. What do the liberals and legalists in our day have in common? They're both more concerned about earthly, social, political matters than they are about the salvation of souls. They both obscure the clear teaching of God's Word. The liberals by taking away from it and the so-called conservatives by adding to it. After Jesus silenced the Sadducees, it was the Pharisees who tried their hand at testing Jesus. Our text says, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Now the Pharisees had done things like this before. What they wanted to do is get Jesus to take sides in one of their religious quarrels. And since they couldn't agree with each other on which of the hundreds of commandments, uh, both from Scripture and ones that they had invented, were the most important, Jesus couldn't answer their question without involving Himself in some kind of fruitless debate which would surely dis discredit Him in the eyes of some. And that would be enough. They were legalists. They believed that God's law could be reduced to rules. Lots and lots of rules. 613 rules. And they wanted Jesus to choose which one was more important than the others. So what does Jesus do? He ignores the rules and He goes back to Scripture. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And right there, 
he gets to the heart of the problem with the Pharisees. You can't reduce God's law to rules. The Ten Commandments aren't even rules, really. You can treat them as such, and you can pat yourself on the back for not stealing or murdering anyone or cheating on your spouse. But Jesus won't let you treat the Ten Commandments like rules. Just read the Sermon on the Mount. The love that God requires is far greater than the boundaries that rules set for us. God's law isn't simply a matter of do this or don't do that. It's a matter of loving God with our whole heart, life, and mind and putting our neighbor ahead of ourself. God's law may be summarized in this way. The God who made you, redeemed you, and sanctified you demands from you everything that you are, everything that you have, for everything that you are and everything that you have is His. And giving it all back to Him isn't an option. It is necessary to give God anything less than your whole heart, your whole soul, your whole mind earns for you eternal death. That's the radical nature of God's law. It makes sinners of us all. You could obey all the rules ever made and still not begin to obey God. Because until you desire Him above all things, until you live for Him before living for yourself, until you always perfectly think of what He has to say before thinking of what you have to say, by the standard of God's law, you are damned. Rules are necessary for children so that they will learn how to behave. But love is the requirement of God's law and no amount of rules can turn a heart of stone like yours into a heart that loves God above all things. Only Christ can do that. The liberals who deny God's word are without hope. You cannot have Christ without his word. The legalists who trust in the rules are without hope. If salvation is found in the rules, there is no need of Christ at all. Jesus, much to the frustration of the Pharisees, isn't all that interested in discussing the rules. So he asked them a question, the real question that should have interested them, especially in light of the summary of the law that he has just given them, which exposes their sin. What do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? That is the real question of theology. And that is the only answer for sinners. Now, the Pharisees knew that the Christ was David's son. But there was more to it than that. David's son was also David's Lord. How is it then that David in the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? Go ahead, Pharisees, you experts in the law, explain that. But they couldn't. And what's worse, they probably didn't even care. Because their religion was simply a matter of do's and don'ts. It had nothing to do with the Christ and the promise of the gospel. But as I said, this may very well be the most important question of theology. What do you think about the Christ? That word Christ means anointed one, Messiah or Savior. It's as if Jesus is saying to those Pharisees, forget about what rule is the most important. That's not the main issue. 
The real issue is this, that God demands your entire devotion, your whole heart and soul and mind, and you have failed miserably. The wages of sin is death. No amount of watering down God's Word and no amount of rule-keeping can fix this. You need a Savior. You need the Christ. And so you better find out who He is. He's David's son, yet also David's Lord. How can this be? Well, there's only one way. The Lord God Himself must become a baby born of the seed of Abraham, traced through the patriarchs, Isaac and Jacob and Judah and Jesse and David, and finally, a young virgin girl by the name of Mary. The only way for David's son to be David's Lord is for God to become man. And only this God-man can do what God requires of man. Only God in the flesh can fulfill what God demands of all flesh. It was only the man, Jesus, who truly loved God with his whole heart and soul and mind. Only Jesus who perfectly fulfilled the law. Only Jesus who loved God perfectly. In the Christ, David's Son, yet David's Lord, we see God and man united in one person. And we see love like nothing we have ever seen anywhere else. Perfect love for God above all things. Perfect love for his neighbor as himself. That perfect love for his neighbors as himself led Jesus to the cross as our substitute to take upon himself our sins and our death. That perfect love for the Father led Jesus to obey the Father's will that one should die for the sins of the many. And because this son of David was also David's Lord, because this was God in the flesh, his life was of infinite value, valuable enough to take the place of all mankind. Liberal religion, the religion of Sadducees, is a religion of mockers. People who are too smart in their own estimation to submit in humble faith to mysteries beyond their understanding. It is most often the religion of the elite, the intelligentsia, the politically powerful, but it is spiritually empty. Professing to become, professing to be wise, they make themselves fools. Legalistic religion, the religion of Pharisees, is perhaps a more serious threat to the church, especially in our cultural moment. After all, we're rightly concerned about the moral decay of our culture as it abandons all standards of decent behavior. So the temptation is to believe that the solution is to be found in more rules, more discipline, a bunch of legalism and traditionalism to counteract the liberalism that surrounds us on all sides. But the antidote for one spiritual poison is not another spiritual poison. Legalism is poison to the soul. We have no right to water down God's radical requirement of love to doable rules and traditions invented by religious people. And we must recognize that Christianity is not a social program. It is not the intent of Holy Scripture to provide us with an outline for the perfect society. There will be no perfect society this side of glory. John tells us that his gospel was written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Jesus reveals both the purpose of the scriptures and the mission of the church in John 24:41. Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. To be sure, we are called to love our neighbors 
We're called to work within our vocations to promote the good and the true and the beautiful according to God's word. If we want to truly see cultural reform, it's not going to happen through the multiplication of rules or through the election of the right people. It's going to happen through conversion. As Sadducees and Pharisees alike are brought to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, only then will they be set free to begin to love God and their neighbors. Only then will they have a proper view and understand what the Ten Commandments really are. God's instructions on how to love, requiring the perfect love that only Jesus ever fulfilled. That this perfect law of love is to describe our lives and when it doesn't, we must agree with its judgment that we are poor, miserable sinners deserving of God's present and eternal punishment. Then and only then will we set aside our own religious agendas and get to the real heart of theology. What do you think of the Christ? He's David's son. He's David's Lord. He is the God-man, Jesus Christ. And for those who have found the pure and holy law of love rightly condemning them, that's the greatest news of all, the Gospel. The good news that the God-man takes all that condemnation away from us. How can David's son be David's Lord? We know how. Our Lord became our brother, incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, made man. And as our brother and in our place, He loved. His love is the pure obedience from the heart that God now reckons to us as righteousness. His love faced all the hatred of humanity on the cross and triumphed over it. He died for Pharisees and Sadducees, both ancient and modern. He calls all to repent and trust in Him. For those who repent and believe, the law condemns them no more because Jesus has borne its condemnation. In Christ, we have the love that God requires of us. In Christ, we have God's forgiveness for our failure to love. In Christ, we are blameless. No amount of rules could capture our hearts and teach us how to love God. But God in Christ has. And now, both Sadducees and Pharisees, by repentance and faith in Christ, are given a new identity. Christian. In the name of Jesus. Amen.
that great gift and pray for a health for mother and child. Uh, let us rise for prayer. Lord God, fix our faith on your love shown to us in Christ. Give us your Holy Spirit. Increase our love for you and for our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give peace, O oh Lord, to those who wait for you and let your creatures be proven faithful. Preserve your church and let all Christians be glad to enter into the house of the Lord. Send laborers into the harvest and bless the work of all missionaries, especially the Jastrom, Bombaro, Preuss, Rickman, Neufer, Schoenfeld, and Federalist families. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, your Son is bridegroom and Lord, faithful over your house and church. Raise up the sons of our congregation to follow your word and bless their families with godly lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of lords, by the reign of your Son, govern all things in heaven and earth. Raise up true Davids among us to govern our land in faithfulness and in humble strength to do your will. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, is seated at your right hand, even now subjecting every enemy under his feet. Give this certain confidence to us and to all your saints in this veil of tears, to the needy, the troubled, the joyful, and expectant, and especially to those who have requested our prayers. Melinda, Rachel, and Lauren, and, and their little ones. Uh, also, the family and friends of Larry, who mourn, the sick, and in need, including Fanny, Gerald, Jennifer, John, Sylvia, Crystal, Arlene, Ken, Ryan, Walter, Alan, Stetson, Cheryl, Juanita, Eric, David, Rhonda, Betty, Alvina, Larry, Cherry, Abby, Brent, a student of Amy, Sue, Dale, Chrissy, Thomas, James, Ruby, Sarah, Jim, Christina, and Alicia. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, have you call us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, your holy Christian church. As we come to receive the peace of the Lord in the sacrament, let this true peace be with us always. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of hosts, you have shared your own glory with your saints, seating them on the thrones of your heavenly reign. Draw us also to your house to sit among them as David of old, and so receive your heavenly benediction. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. upon you and give you peace.
Depart in peace, sins forgiven. Thanks be to God.